Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Leonard Weinstock, a professor and clinician board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology. Welcome. Thank you so much. Will you share your story on how you were first drawn to the practice of medicine? Oh goodness, uh, I think I was designated to be a professional. My family saw something in me that always wanted to uh, impart that you should be a doctor. My father was a dentist, my uncle was a pediatrician, and then uh, my eldest cousin became a doctor. And I think people saw that I wasn't a businessman and was more a people person. It was kind of in the family, huh? The yes, indeed. Doctor. Uh, what attracted you to the study of internal medicine and gastroenterology? Well, those two fields are really uh, detective fields. And I just love the idea of dealing with people's symptoms and coming up with the answers that might be obscure or uh, uh, straightforward, but would help the patient a lot once you made the diagnosis. And then with gastroenterology, there's also some surgical aspects to it. Let's say somebody's bleeding, you could go in and stop the bleeding. So I kind of like the surgical aspect, but at times, uh, and many times in gastroenterology, the diagnosis is not straightforward. They have obscure symptoms and you have to put on your thinking cap and really delve into the issues. Right. When you first started, uh, did you uh, start out with your own practice or were you in a hospital-based practice? So I joined a, a very busy solo gastroenterologist. He'd started GI in the Midwest, was the first to do colonoscopy, and uh, he never had a partner. And he asked me to join him while I was a fellow at Washington University. And so I joined his practice, and it was a private practice, but we did a lot of teaching. And so we did have uh, a clinical appointment at the university. Okay. And, and tell us uh, where you are at today with your practice. Currently, uh, there's five doctors and three physicians assistants. We have our own endoscopy center. We have a busy office. And um, it's successful and, uh, and uh, a fairly big hospital load but luckily call only once out of five weeks. Mm -hmm. When did you get uh, introduced to A4M? Really with a phone call from Siwan. So I was not really familiar with it. Of course, I deal with uh, integrative physicians and I know a little bit about A4M, but this is my first occasion to teach or attend this conference. Awesome. So, yeah, earlier today you led a presentation titled uh, Mast Cell Activation Syndrome, the Forgotten Side of the Immune System. Can you give us a little overview on that session? Certainly. Um, this is a condition not well known to uh, individuals in medicine. Yes, the allergists know uh, a bit about it, but there's some misperceptions there. And uh, this came into the scene around 2007. Uh, with a small case series 2011 and a large case series in 2017. And it is an amazing condition. It uh, affects every part of the body. Uh, hence, people can come in with 48 symptoms that really bother them or destroy their life. And uh, I was introduced to this disease by a patient. I wasn't taught this in medical school or in residency or fellowship. Uh, but a patient called me up because of my expertise in low-dose naltrexone. She thought it would be good for her condition, so I learned about her condition, taught myself a lot about it by reading, and then helped her. We published a case report on her dramatic improvement using a unique set of um, therapies. Oh, okay. Uh, what were some of the, the key takeaways that you were hoping to impart on the people that attended your talk today? To be aware of this condition, the overlap with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, 
and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, a hyperflexibility disorder. Uh, the idea that you can help so many patients who have been bounced around from doctor to doctor, disregarded, um, told they had one artificial functional syndrome or another, but put it all together under one umbrella and really try to help a patient. And that's the most exciting thing that I've seen. Patients have suffered for decades. They've seen many doctors. They stop reporting their symptoms because the, they're afraid the doctors will think they're crazy. But once you start treating them, the symptoms go away and they can melt away, melt away uh, with simple uh, over-the-counter medications, as a matter of fact. Wow. And how recent have these discoveries or developments taken place? In the well, treatment? you know, the genetics of this disorder came about in 2007. There was a similar disease that's more of a malignant disease, systemic mastocytosis, that's been known for many years. But really, um, around 2007 and a little bit before, people were recognizing cases where they had mast cell activation symptoms like mastocytosis patients, but they didn't have the malignant form of mastocytosis. And so people started measuring the chemicals, the mediators that the mast cells secrete and documenting it, but also documenting that they did not have a bone marrow full of malignant mast cells. So uh, they came up with more of a uh, benign syndrome, yet the benign syndrome belays the fact that it's all often horrible symptomatology with poor quality of life. Mm -hmm. You know, th this is an interesting group, the AFRM, because unlike other medical societies where uh, it might be all cardiologists or all primary care physicians or whatever, you know, this it has uh, doctors from all different backgrounds, uh, even chiropractors. <laughs> There's, uh, I've interviewed dentists who, who have uh, gone uh, to these different conferences and gone through fellowship training. But why do you feel that this talk was important for, for this diverse audience? Well, it pulls together what they do. So a, a number of people see uh, patients with tick-borne disease or mold uh, disorders. Well, the fact is, it can start off with the patient actually having mast cell activation syndrome, and those two uh, factors can exacerbate it, and what you're looking at, or what you think you're looking at, are Lyme disease or um, mold-induced disease, uh, chronic illness, um, inflammatory disease, and yet the underlying go-to disease that they're experiencing is MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome. So you do have to treat the triggering uh, diseases, uh, the triggers, uh, look for other chemical triggers, food, uh, and so forth, but then get down to the treatment, and of course, you need to have the diagnosis first of this uh, amazing syndrome. And finally, this syndrome is common. Uh, perhaps 1% of the Americans have it, and in Germany, 5 to 10% have this syndrome. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people are suffering it. It can be congenital. Uh, it can start in birth, get better, then get worse at uh, menstruation or puberty time, and then get worse during pregnancies uh, or other stress factors such as stress uh, and um, infections. Yeah. Yeah, oftentimes uh, people go to see an anti-aging functional medicine physician because uh, they have not gotten better, uh, you know, seeing their uh, conventional doctor. So something uh, imparting knowledge like this to this group of physicians, this is kind of right up their alley. They're always trying to get to a root cause and and uncover, you know, what's really happening as opposed to just throwing, you know, pharmacy at it. Right. Absolutely. I, I've talked to a number of integrative doctors who said, "Oh my gosh, this is." explain so many of my patients right and as it does it really does um, and then the gastroenterologists and all the subspecialists have their patients say they just can't figure out FDA guided medications doesn't work because something systemic is going on and basically it's this aberrant genetically modified mast cell that they own 
that activates and releases chemicals, and those chemicals activate normal mast cells. So you get this storm of mediators that uh, cause symptoms in every part of your body. So you're also currently researching the connection of gut and small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Uh, will you explain how this research is being conducted and what findings that you've had uh, so far? Certainly. That and two other issues. Um, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, was found by doing breath tests in my uh, 139 mast cells in this one uh, study. And I found that 30% had an abnormal hydrogen breath test compared to 10% of controls. Um, this is an effort to explain the bloating, the very common bloating phenomenon that occurs in over 60% of patients. They have sudden onset of bloating, uh, many of them without eating. And it's thought that the chemical mediators just paralyze their gut and it swells up. Uh, so that's, uh, it's important to detect SIBO because uh, treating the bacterial overgrowth can diminish the inflammatory reaction going on in the gut, which therefore would reduce the leaky gut and the inflammation that the mast cells that live there are getting. So if we could find different specific causes to take away from the activation portion, that will help. Um, the other thing that uh, interests me is symptomatology. And so patients with restless leg syndrome uh, I, were thought to be common um, in MCAS patients, but nobody ever published the work. So I looked at uh, my patients, 175 patients with mast cell activation syndrome, and, in, and looked at the prevalence of restless leg syndrome. And it turned out that 40% of patients uh, had restless leg syndrome compared to 10% of controls. And I, I along with my co-investigators, uh, just published that. And then I've got a publication that I need to get done with and write, write up completely, submit on the uh, problem of tinnitus, so ear ringing. Um, a ringing in the ears, noises in the ear for no explanation was found to be present in 60% of my mast cell patients compared to 10% of controls. And that's dramatic. And so patients, some patients say they never knew a time when they didn't have ringing in their ears. It can interrupt with sleep, but it's an odd symptom. And it goes to the fact that these mast cells are getting into the brain and contributing towards phenomenon there, which would include restless leg syndrome and tinnitus. So this inflammatory process, it's not just in the gut or the skin or the nose, it's also in the brain. And it's known that there are a number of unrecognized neurological disorders, panic attack, depression, anxiety, to mention three, that are caused by mast cell activation syndrome. So we can help a lot of people. Yeah, it sounds like some interesting investigation that you're doing. Yeah. You. I'm sure they'll uh, want to have you back to talk to this group again. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome.